sorry. Sorry, I'm a little late. And I'll have to leave uh, 10, 15 minutes before the, uh, the end of the lecture because I have to drop somebody at the airport. It's quite urgent. So um, sorry that I'll have to kind of quickly go through what I have to go through today. Um, and I, I don't have a lapel mic, but I think I can, I can project my voice loud enough. Um, can you hear me? When you say no, I knew you could hear. Yeah, um, yeah the, 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 uh, what do you call it? the roving mic has just run out of battery, so I'm just going to have to project. So um, today we're going to talk about the joys of motherhood, which is um, a text by um, a very important African writer, Bushi Anachete, one, uh, one of the pioneering female writers in the country. Um, and I'm hoping that you manage to get a hold of the book. Uh, it was published in 1979. Um, and um, she is considered one of the earliest writers in the continent, at least in the modern, in the, in the, at the time that modern institutions around storytelling were being set, who was grappling with the gender as, as a category of analysis, as a category of, of identity, in various aspects of gender, as you can see in the novel. So well, I'm go what I'm, try I'm going to try and do is to try and uh, frame uh, Bucci and Machete in relation to um, African literary feminism, or African feminist, feminist literary criticism. It's the rise of African feminism, the, the rise of feminism as an intellectual project um, um, in the continent. Obviously, uh, one can't do justice to uh, uh, how big and how wide and how complex feminism as, as an intellectual project is, but I'll just put out a few pointers, drop a few names that I'm hoping you can pick, pick up on your own um, and figure this out, and then we can just quickly talk about the text, uh, and, and then I'm going to have to dash out very quickly. Can you hear me at the back? Sorry. <clears throat> usually, the, the, the roving mic, um, it's, they usually leave it charging here. I think someone might have forgotten to leave it there. So, kind of run out of battery. raise your hand and I'll try and project. <clears throat> so um, so just a few a few biographical facts about Bucci Machata is that she was born in July 1944 in Nigeria and she moved to the UK at the age of 16 in 1960. Um, studied sociology at the University of London uh, and uh, she moved to the UK because she was getting married to uh, someone that she had been betrothed and um, it turned out to be a, a really crazy marriage, and um, it was violent. And uh, part of her project of writing was actually to grapple with her, her status as a as a woman and as a mother who um, want, wanted to pursue her own profession and go to school. Um, and so, if you read many of her novels, there are a few biographical things that, uh, that come up in those novels. Uh, uh, one of the interesting things was that when she was growing up as a girl. Uh, she had to convince her father the, uh, the importance of, of um, going to school because she was overlooked in favor of her brothers and eventually she was sent to school and you know, she ended up um, being the person that she is. So she's one of the pioneering female modern African authors uh, and she has over 20 books that she's published. Uh, and the, the ones that I put there are just a few the ones that are, are more popular and more widely read. And you can you can tell from the from the titles that they, they have certain thematic concerns that uh, are important for her. Um, when she moved to the UK and got got you know got married to this guy, she ended up getting five kids, 
and at some point, um, her husband, I think, was, was quite jealous of her kind of um, writing uh, profession. And she had published, I think, two or three novels. And he ended up taking one of the manuscripts for, I think, the bride price, and actually burning it. Sure. And then she had to recover it and, and rewrite it again. And you know, um, so it's a she's she's a really interesting author in that regard. Um, but of course, you know, also very accomplished and in one in, in some ways a trailblazer for many uh, um, female authors in the continent in that regard. So over 20 books. These are just some of the few that um, she's known for. Destination Biafra is particularly interesting uh, because I don't know. If, if you're aware of the uh, civil war that uh, took place in Nigeria between 1967 and 1970. It's been a topic of um, conversation for a while. Uh, and um, she's one of the few female authors who tries to grapple with not just the role of women, but um, the consciousness around gender and sexuality in relation to that war at the time. Um, but what is interesting about, uh, about her and the kind of um, if I could call them the, the contexts of gender in Nigeria that go back to the late 19th century, and I'm going to talk about it. There's a, there's a long history of women who mobilized uh, at different times in the country, uh, in the face of uh, British colonialism, in the face of local forms of patriarchy, in the, in the face of various forms of economic organization. I'm going to talk about that a little bit. But Destination of Biafra is an interesting, is an interesting text in regards to that, that whole narrative about the civil war. Um, and you know that you know, close to three million people died at the time. Uh, most of them were children. Those of you who would have, uh, you know, would have read stories or, or watched videos or been alive at the time, uh, you'd have known that there, there were campaigns all over the world to try and uh, and, um, and uh, resolve the, the crisis that led to the conflict. And 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 um, um, basically, the, if I can quickly just summarize what what the Biafran War was about. Uh, the southeastern state of the country decided to secede from, you know, from the larger Federal Republic of Nigeria. And this is part of what we have been trying to grapple with, uh, with people like Ngugi and Aiko Yama, the crisis of the nation state, when, when um, um, different groups of people are suddenly are forced to live together, and they have to uh, refer to themselves as Nigerians or South Africans. Uh, often, these kinds of conflicts began to emerge. Um, and what's interesting about Nigeria is that uh, uh, the, the northern part of the country was predominantly Muslim. It had a long history of uh, um, Islamic contact from, from North Africa and from Asia. And so for centuries, uh, it was very much embedded in, in, in Islamic civilization. And then this, the, the southern part uh, was more um, um, somewhere in between uh, um, Christian, uh, Christian and tradition, somewhere in between longer contact uh, with Europe and you know the kind of local customs. So there are three very, very disparate regions, not just in language but also in religion, uh, in culture, and all of that. And you know the British colonial governor at the time, in the early 20th century, Frederick Lugard, apparently sitting in his kitchen, decided, let's just put all of these regions together and call them one country. Uh, and they were lumped together, and they became. Uh, you know, British colonial Nigeria, and um, even though there was an awareness that the people in the north did not want to, did not want to associate themselves with the people in the south, they had their own way of doing things. And so, when you think about Boko Haram, you heard about Boko Haram. Mm -hmm. you know, one has to go back to, to those histories of map making, these decisions that are made around how borders of countries, how well, different countries become nation states. In that regard. It's always fascinating when we think about. Lesotho's relationship geographically to South Africa, uh, which is a country in another country. Um, often when you think about, when you look at a map, countries are contiguous to each other. And there's a really weird concentric relationship and this assumption that Lesotho is a radically different and that it has to be, it has to be borders around it in relation to South Africa. So it's map, map making you know, has, has a long history of a, um, kind of imperialism that, that one has to grapple with. So Boko Haram, the effects of Boko Haram, well, the, for me, the, uh, when, when we think about Boko Haram now, we have to go back to, uh, to those earlier kind of imperial forms of map making, decisions that were made around uh, cartography, 
So Biafra then ended up becoming one of the biggest flashpoints in Nigeria's history. And there was obviously that the, it wasn't just the cultural differences. There was the oil, uh, the resources of oil uh, that were in the, in the southeastern part of the country. And the relationship to that oil with the British and the French and other people with all sorts of interests. Um, so it's, a, it's quite an interesting uh, um, thing. Um, I hope you can still hear me at the back. Can you hear me? Thank you. So some of the kind of ongoing thematic concerns for Bucci and Michetta are questions around motherhood, child slavery, um, and, and particularly when she moved to the UK in 1960, she began to obviously be conscious of race and the intersections between her, her race as a black woman, um, her, her race as black, and her, her gender as a woman at the time. And if you read some of her novels, Second Class Citizens, I assume, comes from you know, the idea that she's not just a woman, but she's black and she's an immigrant at the same time. So these, these you know, um, intersections of identity became, began to become very clear for her uh, as, as part of what was described at the time as black British identity. Um, and one can take that in all sorts of directions. She's obviously also interested in uh, freedom through education, especially for, for girls. Um, and um, from her own kind of personal history, many of her novels are always trying to grapple with the, the tensions between the tensions that, that usually come out of the way um, families are organized in relation to uh, um, uh, the division of labor and the roles that men and women, men and women are supposed to play in those, in those kinds of uh, intimate spaces. And I'm just, I also have, sorry, wow. what happened there? Okay. So if we if we decide to place Buchi and Mecheta amongst our contemporaries, these are some of the other names that you know or you can pick up and see people who are writing at the time as well. So Flora Noapa, um, very famous Nigerian author as well. We we know Bessie Head, she's considered Buchi and Mecheta's um, contemporary as well. Mariama Ba from Senegal, Ama Ataidu, Aminata Sofo. Grace God from Kenya, Zainab Balkali, Miriam Tali, South African, uh, Zulu Safola, Nigerian, amongst many others. So early 60s. And it, it, you know, obviously, the, 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 if you look at the African writer series when it was set up, it was predominantly men. Uh, and it's people like Buchi and Micheta who opened up that space for more stories from women. And, and you know, um, um, Flora Noapa, and, and particularly Buchi and Micheta, published significantly with African writer series. So they were really trailblazing in terms of uh, publication of stories by women and, um, in the continent. So if we can just open that kind of generation up amongst all those women, these are some of the names that um, you can think about. I don't know if you recognize any of these names. Bessie Head? Yeah. <coughs> Mariama Ba? Yeah. Do you remember Mariama Ba's Solo a Letter? Yes. Um, any other? Amata, I do? Yes, The Name of the Ghost. The Name of the Ghost. Uh, who, who authored No Sweetness Here? Same, Amata. Huh? Is it Amata? Yeah. So these are um, really, really important uh, female authors from the country. And they're just, not all of them, obviously. I mean, uh, there are a whole range of others. That, that I'm sure you might know. I just put those. So uh, just to kind of build some theoretical context for, for what we're talking about. Um, some of the key concerns for people like Buche and Mecheta was the representation of gender in African literature, how gender as a topic, as a theme, um, was represented. And if you are thinking about someone like Chinua Achebe, for instance, um, in Things Fall Apart, you will see that he's kind of creating a society uh, that had very clear gender roles, right? at least in the way that they're represented in the novel. But <clears throat> the kind of archive that Achebe um, consulted to, to kind of craft his story, uh, Igbo learned mid 19th century, uh, mid to late 19th century, um, also had its own cracks. And so one of the things that, for instance, Achebe has been accused of eliding in, in terms of that kind of archive is some of the 
mobilizations amongst women, and some of the, 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 the revolts and the uh, organized kinds of rebellion uh, amongst women in the late 19th century, early 20th century in Ebola. And there's this assumption that Okonkwo as a figure, or the, the, the men in that society are extremely dominant, and the women are all passive, and, you know, even though he doesn't necessarily uh, represent all women as passive. I mean, they're you know, very complex female characters in the novel. But it began to emerge that uh, um, African and black women needed to begin writing <coughs> into that outside and coming up with their own stories. And so Flora, Flora Noapa, one of the authors that I've mentioned earlier, her first novel, I think it was a full, was a kind of a writing back to this male tradition um, of, of African writing, particularly people like Achebe and the others. So gender, as, as it's represented in African literature, is a key and important um, uh, topic. Uh, in the first generation of African writers in the, in the first decade of independence. Um, thinking about gender as an, an identity category, obviously some of these debates have shifted over the years. Um, when we talk about sexuality, we begin to open up a whole range of other interesting things with regards to sexuality and uh, the analysis of identity, as opposed to just gender as a kind of a broader, bigger category. Um, and particularly in post-colonial African literature, how, what are the connections between gender and the nation? You know, what are the connections between, um, what is the future of, of gender as a, as a category in a nation that is trying to imagine itself? In other words, not just the roles of women. Every time I talk about role, it sounds very, you know, if, when, when you hear people talk about the role of women, it, it sounds very, uh, how do I put it, um, instrumental. And yet it's obviously more than that. You know, there's also uh, a, a kind of a consciousness, there's a, a philosophical principles around that. It's not just the kinds of roles that men and women play. But postcolonial identity had to be rethought um, through gender as a category of analysis. So gender and nationalism in, in Africa became an important topic at the time that Uche Macheta and them were writing. Um, and therefore then the, the rise of feminism as an intellectual movement. And People often get this wrong. They, when, when people talk about feminism, some people think that uh, um, there's this assumption that, that the kinds of practices that are uh, uh, conceptualized and theorized around feminism are new. And often one has to remind people that you know, the word is, is used to refer to an intellectual movement. It does not mean that there, there were no forms of mobilizing amongst women or any kind of consciousness around gender before these con con you know, concepts came up. So one has to make it clear, that, you know, as an intellectual movement, um, uh, in terms of how societies organize themselves in institutions um, and how people's lives are organized, you know, as an intellectual movement. And this is why, for instance, when you look at the history of mobilization amongst women in that part of the world where Buche Micheta comes from, if you're thinking about the, the mid, -19th, mid uh, 19th century, feminism as an intellectual concept wasn't there, at least in the way that you know people are thinking and writing, or you know, uh, in academic spaces. So one has to constantly make that distinction. So, so again, I, I just want to mention a few names here that um, uh, of um, people who uh, theorized and thought about um, feminism in relation to the continent. Uh, I don't know if you recognize any of those names, so you can just kind of Google them on your own. Uh, Florence Stratton, and these were like early thinkers. So you think about the 60s, let, you know, the late 50s, the 60s, and the 70s, like people who began thinking at the time when modern African literature was set up about feminism in the context of, of the continent. Obviously, we know feminism as an intellectual movement goes back to early 20th century in Europe, uh, in the 30s and the 40s. But the context of the continent, these are some of the people who have been writing about it. And some of them have come up with specific words that refer to specific kind of local violences of feminism. And the examples I'm giving there, Stewanism and negofeminism. Um, um, and of course, uh, the debates, are, as I pointed out earlier, are a lot more different, not different, but they have evolved over time. I mean, this is 40, 50 years of this kind of thinking. Um, um, when we talk about sexuality in the continent, one has to think about um, 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 queer identity in the continent as, 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 a, as a kind of a rising, important category of identity and analysis. And we know that South Africa's constitution uh, 
was one of the first in the continent to begin to recognize uh, queer identity. And, and, and what was interesting, at least in the way that I saw it, uh, um, queer citizenship became the benchmark within which to um, then begin to judge our human rights and our you know, um, previously radically marginalized identity, identities could be imagined in a new, in a new nation. Uh, so sexuality, queer sexuality at the moment uh, is, is, a, is an important um, um, category of analysis in relation to sexuality and gender. Right? So um, all sorts of um, uh, formulations have come up, gender non-conforming, beyond just the, uh, the, uh, uh, what we know as gay, lesbian, transgender. So it's a, it's a much more complex field of analysis. Uh, and this, this is obviously very early you know, perceptions of it and very early thinking around it in the continent. Um, I don't know if you know Dingavango Inaina in Kenya. Um, he's one of the kind of leading um, public intellectuals around queer sexuality in, in, in and many parts of the continent are extremely homophobic. Uh, and, and, and you know, legislations around sexuality are quite quite rampant across the continent. So so you know just to update us on these these debates. So you can look at some of these people online and see what you make of them. Uh, very important thing to know. Are there any questions up to this point? I'm going to leave around 20 minutes for questions because I, I have to leave a little bit earlier. And then, uh, so many of these thinkers that I've just mentioned before, uh, these people who were thinking about feminism in Africa, began to notice certain patterns around the representation of women, uh, particularly in male author texts. And one of the things was that the woman was used as a trope. Africa figures as a trope of a woman. And that, that was a general kind of form of representation. It was quite common amongst, amongst male author texts, obviously because of certain cultural ideas around gender in relation to, to nationalism. Um, and obviously, this was uh, uh, um, a time when a lot of these women are thinking about the literary traditions that were extremely masculine, extremely, extremely male, and therefore very normative at the time, um, and to find ways of critiquing them. And uh, it turned out, as, as you would read many of you know, early 60s, first decade of independence, women simply figured as mere symbologies of the nation. There's something merely symbolic, as opposed to grappling with the actual lives on the ground of women who were uh, in intimate and in public spaces and the kind of work that they were doing uh, in terms of trying to think about a new nation. And so the representation of women then for this kind of criticism that was coming up in the 60s amongst these intellectuals was that women merely figured as symbologies of the nation. In other words, it meant that the, the discourse of nationalism uh, excluded women. That's what it meant, that they, they simply figured as, as, as symbols, but they were not in the actual they are not included in the actual planning and the actual thinking, the actual you know, um, thinking about these new nations. And so you know, that kind of feminist critique became uh, a critique of nationalism itself. And the nations were gendered as female, and yet the women were excluded and marginalized within homesteads and public life. Uh, and many of the representations uh, women are very flat and dichotomized, either because women um, coming into colonial modernity and now post-colonial modernity were supposed to occupy very specific roles in these economies. Um, and you'll see when you read through uh, um, Joys of Motherhood that there's a, a, a dynamic between the rural area and the urban area. Obviously, they, they are different cultural geographies, if I can call them that. And if you're thinking about many of the cities in the continent, whether it's uh, Johannesburg or, or Nairobi or Cape Town or, or Lagos. For instance, Nairobi at the cusp of, 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 of independence in the, in the 60s, late 50s, early 60s. Um, city spaces were, were very much masculine spaces because the kinds of labor that was required spaces were predominantly male um, um, at the time, or assumed to be predominantly male at the time. And so, the entry of women into many of these African cities uh, was extremely 
marginalized. And women entered these spaces as very marginalized figures, and uh, they then began to be seen as simply people who would then kind of come into the economies of leisure. So for instance, sex work became um, one of the kind of typologies of um, the labor that women provided in the cities. And so many of the earlier representations of women are very much tapped into uh, these kinds of uh, cultural geographies of the city. And, and it, was a, it, was a, it was a purely colonial construct. Uh, the labor that was required, extracted from the hinterland into the cities, was very much one that uh, uh, defined gender roles and decided the men had to come to Johannesburg to be mine workers. And they'd have to leave their women uh, in other parts of, of, of the country. And then women would have to raise those families. And, you know, and that then opened up all sorts of um, issues around the organization of the family, the, the kind of cultural construct of the family. Uh, and I think that part of what we are dealing with today in terms of the, the debates around identity kind of come from the way the movement of people in and around city spaces, urban and rural areas, was legislated, it was um, defined, uh, and therefore it, it began to tinker with um, uh, various cultural geographies that have been existing in, the, in, in, in many of these spaces for many years. So the city and the, the rural area became kind of very, they had this very tense relationship um, as cultural geographies. And you'll see in the novel that uh, when uh, the protagonist moves to Lagos, uh, it's a culture shock, uh, partly because, and I'm going to talk about that a little bit later, that forms of colonial labor that were required from the colonized um, very much feminized uh, these men. And, and the protagonist in the novel, um, her husband, um, does a clinic for, 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 for his master. And, and you know, then there's a very kind of weird tension between what she expects for him to do from how she understands how men do work at home and in the city. And so there are interesting connections between colonialism and patriarchy. And there are people who have made arguments around colonialism as a system, in fact, reinforcing uh, gender roles within societies in the continent. But it, it in fact, bolstered um, patriarchy as a, you know, as, a, as a kind of cultural construct. So these are some of the kind of issues that, that these critics were trying to tease out. Um, in these early representations of the continent. Uh, so I'm talking about colonialism and patriarchy. Sorry for the wrong spelling. Um, uh, an important kind of theorist around that is Anne McClinton. <coughs> she has a book called Imperial Leather. It's titled Imperial Leather. It looks at how, how the, the um, she says something interesting about the way um, British colonialism, um, how it visualized um, the kinds of metaphors that uh, 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 um, British colonialism generated around its, um, how do I put it, its, its interaction with, uh, with the colonies. And they were very, very sexualized. The continent, for instance, was supposed to be this geography where, which was supposed to be penetrated. And there are all these, she, she draws a whole range of metaphors from a kind of a colonial archive. So she's an important figure in that regard in making those connections. You can look up and on. So, <clears throat> If I can just put out a quote here from Efuru's Flora Mappa's Efuru, which the title of the text that we, we are talking about today comes from, um, it's right there. Efuru slept soundly that night. She dreamt of the woman of the lake, her beauty, her long hair, and her riches. She had lived for ages at the bottom of the lake. She was as old as the lake itself. She was happy, she was wealthy, she was beautiful. She gave women beauty and wealth, but she had no child. She had never experienced the joy of motherhood. Mm -hmm. Why then did the women worship her? And uh, if you read through the novel, you come across these mythical figures of women. Um, the water goddess. Uh, it's an enduring metaphor in West African, um, West African literature. There are all these figures, mythical figures, who are um, gendered in a certain way, who are, who are quite abiding in many of the um, narratives of, of, of women at the time. Um, and they could tap into those kind of mythical narratives to uh, try and understand uh, the complexity of this changing world in relation to gender. Um, and I, I assume that this is this kind of intertextual connection between the novel we're reading today and Flora Mark as a Furu is quite clear from that statement. So, um, you know, um, in terms of the text itself, we know that it's set in Lagos in 19, around 1934. 
you know, just 10, 15 years before British colonialism ended in Nigeria. And the other thing I'm flagging out there is that the, uh, there was the, the Abba Women's War <clears throat> in 1929, which was um, one of the historical flashpoints where uh, women collectively organized themselves to fight um, the, the colonial chiefs who had been imposed on them uh, and who were putting all these restrictions around how they could carry out uh, their own trade as, as, as uh, women who control the markets, the food markets. And they organized themselves, and they brought down quite a number of these, these colonial chiefs. In Nigeria? And, yes, in 1929. And in 1910, there was another riot again. A group of women organized themselves. And it was about staking out their role um, socially, politically, economically, within this kind of emerging colonial modernity. Right? So there's a whole range of historical moments uh, around these women who are organizing themselves that is, for a long time, wasn't, uh, wasn't out there in the public. Um, so someone like Achebe in Things for the Park does not quite acknowledge those important historical flashpoints in the world that he's quite trying to represent. Um, and this is just, these are just one or two ones. There are many others. Mid 19th, late 19th, early 20th century, historically. Uh, so one would assume that the context in which uh, Buche and Achebe is writing, the time of the novel, if I can put it that way, kind of taps into that, uh, into that historical flashpoint. Uh, and of course, the, you know, in the novel, the migrations between Ibuza, which is the kind of rural area, and Lagos in the city, and the clear divisions of labor, and the politics of gender that begins to arise out of that. Uh, the protagonist's expectations of her role uh, in this new kind of urban environment, her expectations of her husband's role uh, in this new urban environment, uh, when she becomes a mother, again, various expectations around mother. And as a mother, her relationship to her sons and her daughters, there's a whole range of kind of this, the lives of these women that um, many of the male authors were not really represented. And I think Bucha and Macheta, amongst the others, uh, began to open that up. And so one can talk about the tension between colonial modernity and family life, um, and to begin to see gender as a social construct. And this is a basic idea. Um, gender as a social construct, um, various ideas around femininity and masculinity, definitions of them, expectations of them, the roles that each of these are supposed to occupy. And particularly for Buche Macheta and the protagonist in the novel, mother, the idea that motherhood had to be put on a pedestal and every woman had to be judged on that account. Uh, and therefore, one can talk about gender as a social construct. And I'm just going to put out two quotes by two important uh, people that I'm sure you might have heard, Judith Butler, talking about uh, a stylized repetition of acts which are internally discontinuous, so that the appearance of substance is precisely that, is precisely that, a constructed identity, a performative accomplishment which the mundane social audience, including the actors themselves, come to believe and to perform in the mode of belief. That's what social construction of gender, and particularly sexuality in the public, in the public is about. And then there's Stephen Frosch, who's a, a psychoanalyst, um, who talks about masculinity and femininity as constructions which are built around an atomical difference, signified only because they are granted significance in the context of the particular power relationships that constitute and historically have constituted our social environment. And so he draws connections between the performance of gender and sexuality in relation to power. And that's a, a slightly different dynamic of thinking about, thinking about gender, but which is kind of overarching in the way roles of gender are assigned and assumed to be hierarchically inferior or superior to others. So just two quotes, and, and you, know, you can come up with a whole range of other scholars who try to define what social construction is about. So in the joys of motherhood, constructions of gender, and particularly motherhood, are very clear, constructions of ideal masculinity or even ideal femininity. Constantly, the protagonist is told that this is your relationship to your husband. You must remember, whether you're here in the village or in the city, you have to keep in mind that this is the kind of ideal woman and mother that you're supposed to be um, throughout the novel. And she's constantly battling to kind of see the contradictions um, between those two spaces, a rural area and, uh, and, and the city. Obviously, the connections between colonialism and patriarchy, 
in relation to our own husband uh, and, and, and his employers. And all of these characters, all of these male characters in the novel who are trying to enter the colonial economy, they are placed at different, very complex um, situations. If you read through the novel, you can see that there's, a, there's a, a, an emerging critique around their own sense of masculinity in relation to um, the colonial economy. And the, there's a tension between pre-colonial constructions of gender and the kind of colonial reconstructions of gender that the protagonist has to constantly grapple with. Because the rural area for her is her, her, her frame of reference. She, when she thinks about Ibuza, when she, th she thinks about men and women, <coughs> boys and girls in, um, in her mind, her first frame of reference is the rural area where she comes from. And while living in the city, she can sense that there are a lot of tensions, and there's a lot of kind of uh, things that are now up in the air in that regard. And I'm just mentioning the characters that are in, in relation to motherhood, who are, each of them present very different versions of motherhood. Ona, the, the, the protagonist's mother, uh, the protagonist herself, and, and Adaku, who's a, a co-wife, uh, uh, co in this kind of polygamous family system, um, and, and how the author organizes these characters as foils and contrasts of each other. Uh, and I think uh, only someone like Buche Micheta could come up with a narrative that tries to explore the complexity uh, of motherhood and how different forms of mothering, different forms of consciousness around mothering um, between different characters can actually be represented. Um, at, at the time, in the, 19, in, the, in, the, in the 1960s and 1970s, this was suddenly, suddenly something new and interesting to drop Obviously now, these, are, these kinds of narratives are more, they are more normative now. People are more aware and conscious that um, um, motherhood is a, is a vastly complicated uh, um, construction around gender, and that the roles that one expects to take on in relation to motherhood have obviously become more complex <coughs> as years go by, especially if you factor in uh, same-sex relationships uh, that are uh, becoming you know, um, uh, very common and very important to think about across the world. Uh, it's a whole different um, uh, way of thinking about parenting. <clears throat> um, again, just reiterating, Lagos and Ibuza as kind of different cultural geographies. Uh, uh, construction of labor, um, the different family structures, polygamy in Lagos in the city as opposed to uh, in the rural areas, and the construction of motherhood in these two different areas. Yep. I'm going to stop there. And then I'm going to ask if there are any questions, whether questions from the first two lectures or if I can just, or comments or, yeah. Uh, I just have a question in, 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 in regards to a lot of African women writers. There's a huge gap between those first um, intellectual women who are writing yeah. and the, the African women who are writing now. Mm. Why do you think that is? Because it's like a, a, quite a huge gap you know, in, the, in the writing of, uh, of women writers just basically in, in Africa. You mean a gap in what sense? In terms of in, in terms of in terms of like there's a, there was a huge um, influx of, of women writers during the time that, that when she was writing, mm. and now there was like a, a period where it was like really really quiet to get a, a woman writer who was African, and now there's another huge influx. So what do you think those gaps are caused by in terms of um, history or literature? Or what do you think? That I think, I think uh, we can talk about publishing and how publishing as, as an industry in the, in the 80s really just went down. It became very fragmented. The Cold War was happening, and then structural adjustment programs at the end of the 80s came up, and many publishing economies just collapsed. And in fact, what happened, the history of the continent in terms of, uh, um, in terms of these genres, or in terms of cultural production, then kind of shifted into the popular space. So if you think about pop the rise of popular culture, um, you're thinking about the late 70s, throughout the 80s and the 90s. So that, that is one answer. So you can talk about publishing as an important, and it affected publishing both men and women. Um, so that, for me, is a key factor that, that plays into that. 
But I think the contemporary moment has more women writers than ever. Um, I mean, you, you know, you can you can point out like 100 or even 150 young women writers from the continent now. They're numerous now, and so it's it's, it's flourishing. Um, so that that would be the one answer that I can give you because I think the African literature as a, as, a, as a kind of creative enterprise uh, began facing challenges, uh, partly because of you know, the Cold War and the structural adjustment programs, but also partly because of the, the problems, of, problems of nationalism that were uh, already simmering on the ground and became kind of full-blown, um, really, conflict around, around many African countries. Uh, and that meant that uh, government attempts to, uh, to subsidize publishing, to support publishing houses, went down the drain. So the African Writers Series by the late, I think, late 70s was pretty much off the table. Uh, um, and publishing houses, East African education publishers, uh, which um, Heinemann in, in, in Nigeria also went down. And those were big, big publishing houses at the time. And, and they went down precisely because one, the, the global economy is changing. Many African countries, are, but all these governments that were not invested in a, in a, in a, um, in a creative economy, uh, uh, I think. But also, there was a lot of suspicion towards uh, literacy and towards because fiction is a space that can challenge a lot of ideas about ourselves. Often, people test ideas through through an experimental space, and so fiction becomes a space where people begin to challenge certain ideas of imagining themselves. And so a lot of censorship, a lot of, you know, um, so I, that's the way I can, I'm sure there might be, there are other reasons that, that one can also think about. But suddenly the contemporary moment, at least since the turn of the century, has, has produced numerous young female writers, numerous. Uh, it's an amazing time to, to think about Africa as a kind of space of imagination, I think. Any other comments or questions? Yes. <clears throat> I was thinking maybe um, a lot of women were excluded. Their writings were excluded. Maybe because people did not take women's writing seriously either. They valued more the male voices. Because traditionally, that has been the voice. And perhaps when a woman writes. Uh, once joined the club, there are many um, restrictions. There are many. She's judged a different way. She's judged maybe the way man should be judged. Although the writing as a woman, I write in a certain way because that's how I see, feel, experience things compared to a male person. Yes, that is <coughs> certainly um, one of the reasons. I think. Sorry, could you repeat a little? She says that. In, in terms of answering her question, she's saying that uh, already women in the 60s and the 70s, their writing wasn't taken seriously, uh, already anyway. So uh, um, the gap that she's yeah, talking about yeah, yeah. is partially informed by, by that fact. And, and it's true. Um, even, uh, you know, you think about Buche Macheta, Florian Wabo, these, young, these early mm -hmm. modern female writers, mm -hmm. their works didn't see as much critical attention as male writers. So, so it's suddenly one of the effects already of that period. Yes? I'm ignorant. That is one upsurge of, of, of writing that you're talking about. Is it in English? Is it in French? Is it, is it in, in all African languages since the turn of the century? It's in various languages, is mostly it? in English. Uh, at least what I work on as, a, as, a, as an academic. Uh, but in various languages. But you can find a lot of them in English. You know, East Africa, West Africa. Um, you know, um, this is a lot. It's a lot. I think that the the um, summer school lectures I gave last year were they were about contemporary young writers. So, any other? I just want to add. I think uh, usually the colonial language that we inherit becomes the main language we use to write books. So if you went to Angola or something, you find that the Portuguese more than in Shanghai. Mm -hmm. yeah. And then the same thing will happen if you go to the Congo, and even the Congo, the French speaking, the books will be 
these ones or the ones you're talking about yes. or the yes. ones, the contemporary ones? Well, this. These ones. And the, and the, the ones from the 60s when national when independence was all coming and all that was happening, they were pushing a feminist agenda in spite of this rise of nationalism. Mm. Now, are they, is feminism to a woman writer more important than nationalism? I see the two together because part of, I think part of the rise of feminism, at least in the context of the <laughs> continent, was that there was this divide between the public and the private. And this assumption that the public was the national and it was the, the kind of hierarchically superior space of thinking about identity. When in fact the private uh, is a big part of the equation and it's, it's kind of hitched to the public. At least that is one, one argument that one can put up. So I think those two go together. And so one can talk about gender and nationalism uh, as, as you know, uh, generating an important critique uh, of this idea of the nation. And so a lot of these women were saying the, the kind of private spaces, the intimate spaces that they were designed to their daily lives were as equally important in thinking about the idea of a collective identity of the nation as the kind of public spaces which were male dominated, uh, whether it's in you know, a public service or and, they, and often the nation, the idea of the nation comes from this martial, you know, this martial thing. And, and martial identities are predominantly masculine. And, that, and they're predominantly public. Right? So I, I see them together in that sense. But I think that arguments around nationalism now are different from, slightly different from earlier, and obviously because you know, the world is more the movement of information and people and goods and services and even identities is so transnational, multinational. So this, the, nation, the nation state as a space of, of thinking about oneself uh, is increasingly uh, uh, becoming marginalized and thinking about identity of course, of course, of people. And, and, you know, I think my opinion is that the, you know, the national state needs to die. I think as a form of identity, it doesn't, it's not yielding any sustainable solutions anymore. Even though Brexit is happening and, <laughs> and this, the rise of the uh, um, very right-wing governments. And we have Mr. Trump. You know, and Trump is, <laughs> it's, it will just take us back to but where what we've been running away from. Often because, again, national states are very constructed. Boundaries are so arbitrary. Mm -hmm. The cultural maps that, that existed before that were a lot more fluid. So if you think about, say, um, in, in Southern Africa, if you think about the, um, the Zulu Kingdom, which had been around forever, by the, uh, the mid-18th century, mid 18th century when it began to decline and mid 19th when it was trying to expand itself even further. We know that the effects of that go all the way up to Zimbabwe and all the way up to Tanzania. Mm -hmm. You know, there are people who fled these kingdoms and they're, they're, you know, they're, they're in Tanzania. So how do you begin to assume that they, that they are native to Tanzania and that, they are, and that that's where they belong and that, that those borders that, that separate them, how do you even begin to uh, so I don't know, I just think that uh, the nation state needs to die as a construct, as a, you know, as well, this idea of citizenship, yes. Just to end on, on, on um, what she's asking or questioning, if you're a writer who has been deprived of your own voice within a certain nation, when you start writing and finding your voice, one of the most important things is your identity. And um, so for me, uh, feminism and, uh, uh, and nationalism also like live together because you are asserting yourself as that person who's been deprived of writing within that space. And you are you're telling people what you belong in that space. So for me, it's, it's, it's a, they have to have a symbiotic relationship because as much as you're coming out as a woman, but you, you're coming out as a Zulu woman or a Muslim woman who has never had the opportunity to actually do the writing. Sort of world where, you know, yes, the 
In fact, people who are in international relations and politics will tell you that the word state, added onto the word nation, is what then kind of generates the, the, the geopolitics of the whole construct. That now there are borders, and that, that one can demarcate and say, this nation state starts and ends here. But the idea of a nation itself is very culturally defined. Yeah. It's, it's about nation in terms of the primary definition of nation. I don't know if that makes sense. It does make sense, but it still then means it's not nothing to do with borders necessarily. Again, that's, that might be debatable because even the Zulu kingdom extended itself beyond Kosovo Natal. It, it was annexing land all over. It was a southern African phenomenon. Very it funny. Come down here. But it did cover I mean, a, a significant chunk yes, of southern Africa. Yeah. But you know, yeah, yeah. It's, it's a the idea of citizenship in relation to a nation is so fraught. Um, and you carry a passport or an, or an ID card, you know. Um, and you think about it, and then, you know. You think about people in Lesotho, and you think about the porosity of of of, um, of that cultural geography, and it, it's unfathomable how one can, can just police the movement of people who are clearly geographically, culturally, you know. It, it it doesn't make sense, and these are obviously you know recent histories of of collective identity. And, um, you know, I don't know what, you know, 100 years from now, how the world is going to look like. Because these ideas are constantly coming under challenge. But I think we might have a new platform of collective identity in 100 years' time. Yes. But do you think you pick up on something else that you picked up from your lectures, which is the the movement of writers that So now, as much as 30, 40 years ago, because now there's a, there are audiences within the continent, uh, and there's a whole ecosystem that does not rely on. Uh, there are writers who are uh, as popular without winning any big prizes. You know, so this is, is an, you know, and it's also about how people organize within the continent to try and leverage their own forms of cultural capital. So I think the degrees of that is a lot less than. And often people who go, you'll find that people who go out to win big prizes and expose themselves there, do it very consciously. Because they know that then they can transfer those forms of capital very consciously. They, they, in fact, when they do that, their, their primary audience is not necessarily the West. Their ultimate primary audience is coming back to the continent. So there's also a consciousness around, you know, um, around uh, cultural agencies. Yeah, the way as well that we're in, we're in the 
um, when you speak about black feminism, is that is that simply feminism in Africa, or is it something discreet, black African, um, black African uh, feminism? You know, um, feminism in Africa then just implies a kind of more Eurocentric bias. I think suddenly the, the first wave of uh, uh, feminists in the continent at the time became aware of the kind of racial differences, racial context in which in which um, in which feminists could, could operate, and I guess they began to. Uh, uh, it wasn't just a derivative discourse. I think they began to organize. They began to recognize the context within the continent that meant that uh, um, a woman or, or, or femininity in the continent had its own very distinct. Um, um, environments and, and challenges that, that it dealt with, and one could not assume that feminism as an intellectual movement could simply translate easily from Europe to the continent. I think that was the basic idea, um, and I think there were a lot of there was a lot of modelling around, um, you know, womanism. Um, there was a lot of modelling around African American kind of critical race in relation to in relation to feminism at the time. So, was, are the concepts of feminism or the universal Western feminism that is speaking back against? Or is it a translation? I guess it's both. Um, partly also because that wave of African writers were very much writing back. But at one level, they are writing back to say that we are organizing ourselves, we are uh, an intellectual community that is beginning to refocus our audience to the continent. So they are, I think they were both. They were doing